It's episode 149 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, please subscribe. Click on the links in the right-hand sidebar. And uh, you can make sure that you never miss an episode. Also, subscribing and commenting uh, helps other people find the show. It raises us up in the charts. Also at hankgarner.com, if you look in the right-hand side bar, you'll see links to all of my books. Uh, right there, you can click, get a preview, and uh, it would uh, mean a lot to me if you would pick one up. And uh, when you do, if you like it, please leave a review over on Amazon. Uh, doing this show for 150 episodes, which will be later this week, uh, has uh, been a tremendous joy for me. And on this Christmas week, I hope that you reflect back uh, the way I do count your blessings for the year, and uh, one of the blessings that I have that's come from this podcast is making lots and lots of friends. Uh, so my friend Stefan Boltz joins me today to talk about NaNoWriMo. Uh, last month was National Novel Writing Month. We both came through it with 50,000 words, and uh, we have a chat today to talk about our experience with NaNoWriMo and how we can take the things we learn from that and put that into our everyday writing habit. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy this show, and uh, stay tuned Friday for a very special uh, Christmas episode that I do a tag team with Preston Lay from the Legendarium. Before we get to the interview, please visit our sponsors. ThirdScribe.com is there to connect readers and writers in a new and innovative way. Rob and the crew there have done a phenomenal job at overhauling the site and really catering to the needs of their users. If you are a writer and want to uh, have someone help you feature your books, connect them with an audience, Third Scribe is there to help. If you are a reader and want to discover new writers and new books, Third Scribe is there to help. They're connecting readers and writers. ThirdScribe.com, and please let them know that you heard about it on the Author Stories podcast. Stay tuned for a real quick spot, and then we'll get into our interview. It's worse than that. God will ignore us entirely. A searing act of bioterrorism. A catastrophic plague they call the Pretty Pox. Most of the human race is dead, and for two years, Ari McInnes has been alone writing out the aftermath of the pretty pox, waiting for her own inevitable end. Hidden in the attic of her ruined home, Ari survives by wit and skill, ritual and habit. Convinced that humans are a dangerous fluke, a problematic species best allowed to expire, she chooses solitude, even in matters of life and death. Ari's precarious world is upended when her youngest brother, a man she's never met, appears out of nowhere with a badly injured woman. Their presence in the attic draws the attention of a dark watcher in the woods, and Ari is forced to choose between the narrow beliefs that have sustained her and the stubborn instinct to love and protect. In book one of August Anzel's captivating new post-apocalyptic series, After the Pretty Pox, cast an unwavering eye on what it means to be human in a world where nature has the upper hand, and the only rules left to live by, for good or ill, are the ones written on our hearts. After the Pretty Pox, The Attic, by August Angel is available now on Amazon.com. Check the show notes for the link. Pick up your copy today of After the Pretty Pox, The Attic, by August Angel. August Angel is the pen name of Carla Baku. Find her website at www. Carla B A K U dot com. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I have one of my very best writer friends on the show today. Uh, I'm super happy every time I get to sit down and record a show with Stefan Boltz. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, buddy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Sure. So uh, we're recording this in the middle of December, and uh, I really wanted to uh, sit down with you to talk about NaNoWriMo. And we've had a couple of weeks now to walk away from the keyboard and 
breathe a little bit and, and right. decompress and you know um, get rid of the uh, the the crippling uh, feelings that you get at the end of NaNoWriMo <laughs> that uh, it, did anything I write during that time mean anything is it all rubbish uh, you know so uh, but for the last couple of years uh, well let's see I think this was my fourth year doing NaNoWriMo uh, last year, I did not win because I, I just kind of had too many projects going on and, and, I, and I got distracted and, and working on too many things at once. Uh, but this, this year, I really focused and, uh, and got my – I forget what my total count was at the end, but it was a little over 50000 uh, And I know that you, you are a, uh, a serious, steady NaNoWriMoer, and uh, how many years have you won now? I think this is my third year. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, so, for for folks that may not know, and uh, I don't know who that would be, but if you don't know what NaNoWriMo is... My mother. My mother doesn't uh, know your, what Your mother. This is for Stefan's mother. <laughs> uh, every November, uh, it has been deemed National Novel Writing Month, and the challenge is set down to write uh, a novel, 50,000 words or more, uh, in a that thirty day period of November, I don't know why they picked November because, uh, you know, the Thanksgiving is that month, right. and uh, <laughs> and that's that's just an extra challenge thrown mm-hmm. on you, I think. Um, but tell me how you uh, kind of got started doing Nano. Where did you first hear about it, and what motivated you to try it in the first place? I think it was Hugh Howey that um, mentioned it. A bunch of years ago, I think it was more, three or four years ago, four years ago, and I didn't know it before. And he was, he said, oh, he's doing it again. And um, I looked it up, and I think the first one I did was, because I thought I did it four times, but then I realized the first time I did it was the camp, Camp NaNoWriMo, that was in April. So it's a little different. The rules are different. I think you have 30,000 words at a min- for a minimum, and you can work on existing projects. So I think that's what I did first. Um, and then I think I did the same year, the, the November one. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's how I started out. Um, I heard of it years and years ago, but I, hadn't, I didn't even write when I heard it. So I didn't, I didn't really pay attention, but a friend of mine mentioned it, that she was working on it. And I didn't even know what that was. All, all I could think of was what you write a book in a month. That's completely impossible. That was my thought. I remember that, but that's all. That's awesome. Uh, I, I think I found out about it in a similar way. Maybe it was Hugh. Maybe it was, uh, at around that time, when I first uh, attempted it, I, I was writing my first book, uh, Bloom, and uh, I was, you know, just googling around for you know all sorts of writing advice right, and right. you know all, you know the, the things you do when you yeah. you know are, are working on that first right. book and right. and I, around that time I found Hugh and uh, maybe Conrath and uh, uh, maybe Russell Blake mm-hmm. and uh, just c- some of these authors that were really uh, dispensing wisdom, you know, right, uh, right. and and a lot of us found around that time, and it was one of those guys uh, mentioned NaNoWriMo, and uh, and I just thought, you know, this is uh, this would be a great challenge. Uh, don't know right. if I can do it, but you know, might as well try. And uh, it was uh, th- there's something I think the my experience was uh, that up to that point I had really been. Uh, kind of uh, sweating over every word, mm-hmm. you know, really <laughs> right, wanting to right. choose the right word, right. and then you type a sentence, and you'd erase that sentence, and you say, well, "Let me see if I can if I could say that sentence better," you know, and then then you try it another way, and you erase it, and you know, you know how how you do, and uh, you're just overthinking. And I think uh, the thing that really uh, kind of unlocked for me was uh, saying. Okay, I I understand there are there are different uh, stages in the writing process, and the the first stage is getting the words on the page, right. 
Right. And then the next stage is the editing. And I think for me, Nano really uh, showed me to just kind of turn off that uh, that that inner critic and right. just get words on the page so that you can go back and fix it later. Right. Um, I know that because we've had conversations before where I think you and I uh, are very similar in that regard that we will kind of uh, worry over things and, and, and redo it, and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, in that first stage. Uh, did, did Was it like that for you in the beginning, just learning to, okay, uncheck that and just pour words out? Yeah, I think that was the hardest, the, the hardest thing to do, uh, and I realized kind of that um, – uh, going back and tr- trying to make the sentences beautiful is really procrastinating. There's nothing, there's no other word for it. But for me, it was, that was what it was. I just didn't want to dig in. I wanted to kind of make what I had really nice, but I didn't, for some reason, you know, when you start out, I think there's, for me, there was a big resistance of just doing that. And I think that NaNoWriMo, it, I think it makes you into a writer if you follow it. Because you can't, it's no longer a weekend job. It's, it's serious, you know, not serious, serious, but it's serious because you, you have, you have to face it every day, your word count. And you, you just, you, you can't go back and fiddle with the sentences because otherwise you would spend so much time on, on it because you have to do your 1700 words. You would never get done and, uh, I think it gets you into that headspace where you where you can really take off. You know, your writing can just become a daily a daily practice, and I think it's almost it's like the twenty one day. Uh, it takes twenty one days to change a habit, and I think that's it's great to just to change your daily habit of not writing to <laughs> writing. You know. Or, 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 or editing to writing, just write. Right. Um, one of the, the early interviews I did was with uh, Weston Oaks, and mm-hmm. uh, I think he was. He know, writes a lot. Uh, number, he, well, he does. And, but to hear him, uh, he has a very simple process, and, and I'll have to go back and listen to that interview mm-hmm. again uh, to get. Exactly. So if I if I misquote Weston, I think I'm close, but it, this may not be right. Um, he writes like three pages a day, right. which comes out to like 750 words. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, to uh, to a lot of writers, you, you kind of scoff at that. Well, well, you know, that's not. You know, we, we kind of we put these arbitrary uh, limits on ourselves, right. and we say, oh, well, if I'm going to sit down to write. I need to get like 2000 words, you know, or something. Right. And, and what happens a lot is that you put these limits on yourself or these, these challenges on yourself. And a lot of times you don't meet those. So right. you just give up, exactly. you know, so you, go, <laughs> you go from nothing to, and then you set this unreasonable goal and you don't meet it and you just go back to nothing. Right. Um, you know, if, what we need to do is find a happy medium in there. And, and uh, Weston says he sits down every single day right. and he writes three pages. And, you know, uh, and, uh, and by doing that, he puts out, you know, two, right. 200,000 yeah. word novels a year, you know, right. consistently every year, you know, right. every six months, he's got a new, you know, doorstop novel to put out. Right. And uh, yeah. So I think Kevin, I, I, Kevin G. Summers does 500 words yeah. a day. Before he milks yeah. the cows, he says. Right. No, it's that's, it's really it's great. You get it. You get it out of the way. You're done. You don't have to think about it. You know. Right. Oh. Right. Um, are you much of an of an outliner, uh, or do you just write as it comes to you? And I know the answer to this. But I'm, I'm setting you. Up. <laughs> I might I'm surprise setting you, you up for a question. I might surprise you. <laughs> okay. Well, Whatever, what me. I told you in the past about me not outlining. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's totally wrong. It's yeah. wrong. No, um, it you know it's getting. It's it, I'm not I'm not outlining. I, uh, there's no. <laughs> I was trying to find some words around. You tried that, to be clever I'm, and yeah. It's it's so, it's more like you know what it is. I realize that it's it's an emotional outlining, and what that is is. 
to kind of feel out if the book has, or if the story that you somehow roughly have in your head, it's more the emotion that you go from one to the other. And, and I don't even, you can probably can't even um, recreate what I, what I, what I said, you know what I mean? Because it's, uh, what is he talking about? But it's more like, so what's the theme of the, of the book? You know, um, is it grief or is it uh, love or anything? And then maybe just find, I, for me, there was like in the last book, in the last nano book that I wrote, I realized that I was going from one emotional kind of peak to the next. Um, so there was, uh, you know, just scenes kind of that I had um, that I went from one to the other, but they were kind of emotional high points or low points for the character and then going from one to the next as an outline rather than plot. Have the, uh, the, the nano experiences you've had in the past, uh, have you gone on to publish those books? Yeah. The fourth sage was, um, a big, big portion in the middle of the book was all NaNoWriMo, um, three years yes, ago. That's, that's a, that's a big honking book. Yeah, that's. I think that's 120,000 words, and the, the sort of 50,000 of that. I had started it before. I, I was right. cheating at NaNoWriMo, so if anybody <laughs> is listening, you know, don't knock on my door. But it, it was. I think I had a bunch of I had maybe 20 or 30,000, and then I I did the 50,000 uh, through NaNoWriMo, and then I finished it later. But that was a big chunk, and it really helped me get through just get sh- through that chunk of it, you know, but because you kind of, you, it's almost like television writing when you write, read about um, writers that write for television scripts. It's a weekly thing. You can't keep, you know, take your time, take two weeks off, think about it, let it simmer. You can't. In four days, the whole thing has to be out. You know what I mean? So it, it's similar to that, and it, it gets your juices flowing. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I I go back and forth uh, mm-hmm. between uh, – because I know exactly what you mean, and, and you know, it's it's like the television writing. You've got to show up. You've got to write. Right. You've got to push the story forward every week. Um, Did you have an outline the, for this one? Uh, no, no. I, I – uh, you know, I'm a uh, – I'm not a good outliner um, at all. I, I do have – pieces of the story ahead of time right. and uh, a lot of times I'll keep that in my head and and, and kind of like you I go from emotional peak to emotional mm-hmm. peak or uh, you know uh, you know I know some places that I want to take the story right. and then it's a mystery to me what happens between those two places right. uh, and you know the the characters just you know they they do their thing and they advance the story to that place right. um, so you know there's a uh, uh, I I understand and I do um, agree with being prepared and knowing where the story is going, mm-hmm. uh, but I still believe there's there's some magic that happens in there. You know, there's there's this intangible thing that you just can't put your finger on. Um, you know, sometimes writing is just magic. It's just that the story comes from wherever it comes from. I'm I'm still not convinced of where stories come from. Yeah. Um, you know, and I just, some days I, I know exactly what I'm going to do and I, and I write the scene and it comes out like I thought it would. And some days I'd look back over and I'm like, Oh my God, I, who wrote that? That was not right. me, <laughs> right. you know, and, and <laughs> you know, and you walk away and you're just shaking your head because you're like, okay, I've been doing this four years and I still, I still have no idea right. how this works. <laughs> it's very strange. It is very strange. It's very strange, but, um, but yeah, so I I uh, I did uh, uh, do something interesting uh, for this other book I'm writing that that is not necessarily connected to my nano project uh, right. this year. Uh, but I I'm writing the sequel to Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, and I is it called the Fourteenth this... Son of the Fourteenth. No, it's, <laughs> it's called Seven Grandfathers for <laughs> Seven Grandsons or Seven Brides for se- no, that's, Seven. No, that's a big uh, Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, I've got this this huge roll of paper uh, that uh, I get from our local oh, newspaper. Yeah, 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 I saw that. Yeah, they, yeah, they have these uh, 
these end rolls, you know, that when they, they print yes, the newspaper. Yes, exactly. I know exactly what they, you mean. Yeah. yeah, they they have these giant rolls that are mm-hmm. like five feet across or something. Right. Well, when they get down to the end of the run, it's not enough to do it. Right. So they sell these rolls for like five bucks, and it's like a foot across that or something awesome. like that. And we, we get them, we used to get them for our kids when they were little, and they would do art projects, and it was just a cool thing to have these big sheets of paper that you could do all kinds of stuff with, you know, birthday party banners, yeah, banners and, you know, right. just whatever. And uh, so I, I stretched one across our dining room table, and I started drawing out a map of the first Seventh Son book. Mm. Uh, so it's like I started here, I kind of wrote so all my cool. characters down the left side. Uh, and, I, and I did each of them in a different color marker. Right. Um, and then I, I kind of drew a picture of kind of what that first scene was and just jotted little notes about each character and where they are and kind of what their setup is. And then I would draw lines to the next thing, and I had a, a pictograph of what happened next. And when I was finished, I had a visual representation of the book. I kind of storyboarded the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with these connecting lines and, and you could see all the characters in different colors and I could easily look and say, okay, this is, this is where all the characters ended up at the end. This was their motivation at the end. And this is, you know, where, where I set them up for book two. Uh, so then I, I pulled out another sheet of paper and I picked those characters up from the end of the first one, put them at the beginning of the second one, and then just continued that map out to where. Uh, where I see them going at the end of that book, and uh, and I pin those up in my office uh, above my desk. Yeah. And when you sit down, uh, there's a a visual outline there, but it's not a point by point outline. Right. And I can look up and I can say, okay, oh, cool. Oliver is here, and I want him to be here. And right. how how do I write him from here to here? Right. And and you know, to me, that was that just really unlocked something. Um, so that next year cool. for NaNoWriMo, I think I'm going to do the same thing with the, the book I'm writing uh, for there. And uh, I think that would be really helpful when I sit down each day. Right. To like say, okay, this, this is where the sto- Exactly. This right. is where the story is. I want to get them over here. What do I need to do today? Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, oh. when, you're, when you're moving your characters from emotional arc to emotional arc um, – did you did you see where the character where you thought the character would end up, or uh, are you uh, you know walking down a dark road with a flashlight and you can only see six feet in front of you? <laughs> I love that picture, that image. Um, I think it's a little bit in between. Um, for this book, I, in general, I work a lot with maps. With with. Um, when I wrote The Three Feathers, there was, I think it was until like page 40, I was just writing, writing, and then I started to draw a map of the place that the animals were in, and that completely opened up everything. It, it, that, that was the, um, it was like a faucet that opened, and the whole story came out just because of the map of the locations. So the locations could be they're almost like plot points. You know, you want to get them from A to B literally. And what do you do in that? And then in the white dragon was a lot with maps. Like the first one was long Island map, Um, you know, from location to location. And that kind of also a little bit uh, determined the plot. And with this one now that I wrote for NaNoWriMo, it was, I had the, the final image in my head. Um, but, and, it, and then it was just, uh, not just, but it was a matter of trying to get get my girl from, from point one to the next one. And it's, it was also a physical journey um, through several cities in, this, in the country. And so, you know, you go on Google map, you go, you figure out the bus schedule, the exact bus schedule, where's the terminal, what street is that on? And you go from, you know, from that, so the... the the area the story is set in is part of the of the plot in a way, and in, and it also leads to the next maybe the next scene, you know, maybe the next um, like in, in in the story one of the um, aspects was that she was meeting um, my my main character was meeting this um, 
this girl, she was a concierge in a little hotel that she was in, and she there was I saw on the map that there was this really cool club um, that had like art shows and, and musicians and stuff like that. So I thought, oh, this probably it would be they would probably go there together. So and that from that on, you know, that in, induced a whole plot point. Um, so the location is always is always a very very big item in my stories. I think. Uh- Tell us a little bit about this new book uh, that you started writing for Nano because uh, you are you finished it after that and I think you're going to publish it pretty soon, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah, what's the gist of it? It's a 16 year old girl who lives in Twin Falls, Idaho, and she has a very very rough home. Her dad is in prison. Her younger brother died that summer. Her older brother went to the army, and her mother is is drunk so she r- runs away one morning with her six string guitar and a bag of clothes in her in her school bag from twin falls idaho um she has like 12 dollars in her pocket and she runs away she hitchhikes you know and she makes it across the country you know, uh, Portland, San Francisco, and goes on from there. But, um, and that it's basically her story. And um, it's a very, very emotional journey, obviously. And it was very emotional for me because I, you know, you, you're kind of like, all right, so you're lying, you're lying under the bridge. What, what temperature is it right now? It's 48 degrees. Um, you know, the, you're too far away from home to get back. You don't know where you're going. You have no money. You have you have two cans of fried double fried beans from Seven Eleven. Um, a muskrat is sniffing your foot. <laughs> you know, it, it's so so. Right. It's it's really um, it was a very intense uh, journey for me to to be kind of her. You know what what happens to her and um i just realized in the end so that was really the the great thing with the nanorimo this year because it pushed me through it because it wasn't it wasn't a happy you know there's there are happy moments and stuff like that obviously but it's like life on the road right for a 16 year old girl which is crazy um with anything that can scary but anything that can happen possibly happen right and um she's a very very extremely talented singer but she is nobody, she knows nobody, she has nobody, you know, it's really, uh, she starts from way down at the bottom. Um, but when she reaches her final destination, I was so relieved. I can't even explain, you know, I, I, it was done and I was, I felt like this burden off of my shoulders. Not because the book was finished, but because she was, she came out on the other side of that. You know, it's it was cr- intense, and then also election. You know, there, it was the during the election. Well, Don't get, I, we're not getting political or anything, but I mean, you know, it's so nuts. Yeah. So anyway, so that was the uh, that's the story, yeah. and um, I decided I did in the fourth stage that I that I in, that I integrated friends of mine in the story. <laughs> so she. As you know, she comes to this festival in Oakland, and the, this uh, it's it's a contest, and the singer be- that goes on stage before her is Hank Garner, you know, and he lived in a van for four years, and she's tra- he's traveling the country into Canada, U.S. from festival to festival, he sells his CDs, you know, and stuff like that, so. <laughs> Pretty cool, man. Oh, that's great. Yeah, well, you know, um, when I talked to Craig Johnson, uh, the guy that writes the Longmire Mysteries, right. uh, he was he was terrified for his family uh, to read his first books because he was like, you know, some people say, oh, no, these characters are not based on reality. He said, bull crap. Right. All of my characters are people I know. <laughs> I know. Who you else know, would they be, right? I mean, I know, I know, and I do the same thing. You know, like uh, all of my characters are thinly veiled, you know, representations yes. of people I know. And 
You know <laughs> who you are. very thinly, yeah. So all of the evil characters in my books, uh, I'm going to leave it for other people to figure out who they are. Of course, exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, so I haven't read Six String yet, uh, but I've, I've – I've seen little pieces of it that you've done, and and we've talked briefly about it. Um, this is not a magical tale, is it? No, it's there's zero magic in it. I mean, it's it is w- very worldly. Um, even though it could be considered a little bit of a fairy tale, but it's yeah. really it's uh, it's very real in my head, at least. There are very real problems with shelters, homeless people. You know, being robbed, being whatever. I mean, there's there's very real problems in it, and it's it, it was kind of a. Uh, I just moved to a completely different path from fantasy, sci-fi, and and, and all that to something very real. And I I enjoyed it tremend- tremendously. It makes it harder because there is no magical solution. Right. You know, it has to be. In if she is hungry and she has no money, she has to do something. You know, she even right. if she steals, if she whatever, it can't just she can't just whatever. You know what I mean? So it, it was it was great right. to do that. I loved it. I totally loved uh, being in that in that real uh, setting. Was it uh, was it difficult to shift gears into that in the beginning uh, or? Did it just no, because, feel natural you know what, all the way? What, what I what I also realized is that the emotions were exactly the same. I mean, with the White Dragon, uh, was it's very fantasy, but the emotions are not fantasy, and I think that's what makes it. It doesn't really matter. It's just a you know, it's just a setting. It's the same the same range of emotions that the character will, goes through, whether it's. Uh, Based on real life or based in in a fantasy world, the 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 emotions if they're authentic, I think you can write in any genre if you stay with the character, close to the character, main characters, real, what how they feel, and what they do, yeah. what they think. So you know, it doesn't matter. You know, I um, I, I guess I I always knew that what you just said, and uh, I knew that to be true. Um, but when I wrote writer's block, I think that became more real and more evident to me, Mm, uh, in that I, I had the initial idea that I had for that book, uh, uh, the, the initial kind of spark, uh, was, you know, if you had a magic typewriter, what would you do with it? You know, what, what would you make it do? Um, and so that was the, the, the catalyst for it. Uh, but as I was writing it, you come to realize that that the magic typewriter has very little to do with right. the story. Right. Um, it's a it's a it's a a, 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 a springboard. Yeah. It's it's a, a place to to jump off from, and it does help some characters in there. Uh, but ultimately, that's not what saves Stu. Right. Um, you know, it's a it's a, it, dog. It's a very hu- it, it, well, It's a dog. It's a very human. <laughs> Right. Solution uh, yeah, exactly. that that is the ultimate solution. It's not, uh, you know, the, the magic is uh, is there to kick the story off, but it, it really has nothing to do right. with the story right. in in the grand scheme of things. Um, so I like that. I, I think you're right, and 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 uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what genre you're in or what window dressing you right. put on the story. Right. What, what we're all really looking for is a, a story. Uh, a very human story is something that connects right. with us deeply and something that tells us a little bit more about who we are right. in the world. Right. Now the, um, the other thing um, that was with the six string is that I had to, because she's a singer. So she writes, you know, she writes in a journal and she writes songs and stuff like that. So it's very funny to try to write some songs for the, for the book. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I haven't shown them it's songs that a, that a teenage girl would write. Yes. Oh God. That that's that's not possible. <laughs> no. I really. I'm serious. I I think that's one of the things that I can't I can't do it because it is I I can only write from my own. I th- I think I can uh, figure out what what she would feel and how she would react to certain things, but to write a song from her perspective. 
I mean, that, that's a, a big, big challenge. I don't think that's. I mean, me. I don't know if it how it's going to come out, but I think it's um, that that's very, very hard. That's very hard. Well, that brings up a question. Um, this, uh, and correct me if I don't get this. Well, let's see. The Fourth Sage, uh, both of the White Dragon yeah. books, uh, now Six String, uh, The Traveler, mm-hmm. uh, all from a, a young female right. perspective. Uh, what, what is it about that that intrigues you so much? Is it the, the challenge of of shifting out of your brain <laughs> to something exactly I, opposite? I don't know, but, <laughs> you know, but it, Chloe, my, uh, our daughter, said, my yeah. bonus daughter, Said that in inside that, inside you're just a sad little girl, <laughs> and, she, <laughs> and she meant that really nicely. She didn't mean it in a mean way at all. But I said maybe that's true. Um, oh it was so funny. It was hysterical. I was like, oh my god, you're right. You're right. I think you're right. Have, have you seen the Pixar movie? Uh, is it Inside Out, where the mm, no uh, the, I the little girl and with the brain all with of brain. her uh, yeah and all of her emotions are personified uh, and there's there's this one I think it's sadness and she's oh man she is the saddest little character she's just a you know frumpy little you know always look you need to watch it because right. I think you'll laugh at at what Chloe said if you oh my God. see yourself as her anyway yeah. Uh, that's that's great. Yeah, but but you know, um, I it's it's hard to say. But I think just from a writing perspective, what intrigues me is that the stakes are, I think, just much higher. You know, for um, a girl than a boy. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's not true. But if you if you take for example the the six string, if it's a sixteen year old boy that runs away from home with a guitar. I think life on the streets is probably a little different than if it's yeah. a girl oh. that's 16 and uh, runs away from home. Well, yeah. So, you know, it's, um, it's, the stakes are just much, much higher, I think, with uh, with a girl. Well, when I was growing up, uh, I have an older sister. She's a year and a half older than I am. And it was just the two of us. And my my dad would, like, set curfews for her and stuff, and then not for right. me, and I'm the younger brother, and and right. and right. and stuff, and and my sister would get mad, and and he he would say, well, you know what, uh, Hank can figure it out if he's out there and he gets into trouble, he'll figure it out, you know. He he said, I'm responsible for you in a way that I'm not responsible for right. him, and I always took great offense to that, but <laughs> but then when I had sons and daughters of my own. I know how sexist it is. I, I completely own up to that, but it's true. You feel differently about your daughters than you do your sons, and it, and it's wrong. I know. <laughs> I'm admitting to it, but but yeah, I you know if I if if I imagine Ian, you know, hitchhiking, um, you know, I say, well, you know, one nobody's gonna want to pick him up because he's he's not that attractive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that, Ian? <laughs> Did you hear that, Ian? This is the test to see if they actually right. listen to my show. Oh my um, god, it is. You know, uh, yeah, I would be mortified if one of my girls was out there. You know, and I, I, I totally understand what you. And that is not to disempower women in any way. I'm, no, I'm just saying that from my perspective, I would be scared to death. You know, uh, so yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, especially in six string, I could see where that is about the highest emotional stakes that you could come to the keyboard with. Right. Right. I was also I was even thinking because there were some little issues in the in the story with um one one aspect was that she might have to go to a hospital because she has mm-hmm. uh an infection or something uh or she she has like a fever and she's weak and stuff so she but then I talked to somebody who is in the field of social services, and she, she said that if if you're underage, you go to a hospital. They immediately call the the parents. If they don't reach them, they call social services, and they will not get out of hospital with either a guardian or their parents. So it's you, you, she she can't just walk into a hospital at at 16, get treatment, and get out four days later. It's just not happening. So. 
Um, so then I, I thought maybe I'll make her 18 on her journey. But then I realized that would that also would change everything because it's again different. You know when you're. It's almost you're, like introducing magic. You, you give right, yourself right. an easy out. Yeah, and 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 18 running away from home is still different than 16 because you're 16. I mean, Chloe is 16. If I imagine her being on the streets. You know, and two years from now, where she has way more experience, whatever, it would be again a different story. So um, I had to not in the, <laughs> the hospital. She has to get out of that thing a different way, not to go to a hospital. Because <laughs> like, darn it. Well, well, that that brings up a great question because during Nano, uh, you have to get that seventeen hundred yes. or so words yep. out every day. Um. But well, well, and this was the question I had a minute ago that I forgot to ask you. Um, have you been to Twin Falls, Idaho? On Google Maps. On Google Maps. Okay. All right. Um, so you've got situations like this that are coming up with where you're putting your character and how you're going to get them out yeah. of that. You have a, a setting that you're not familiar right. with other than Google Maps. Um, how do you sit down and make sure you get those words out right while kind of doing research on the fly and uh you know uh do you just turn that off and say i'm going to come back and fix this later right. i'm just going to put a, a nonsense sentence here that i'll know that i need to fill in with actual facts or uh do you give yourself time each day to do some research and write like how do you balance that um i think this it's a combination I, for a lot of things i used placeholders i always do like uh, um braces and do three question marks you know she 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 went to the deli or some some kind of a deli and maybe some maybe that or a, like that dance club i didn't i forgot the dance club's name so or i um somebody told me about that dance club actually so i put three question marks there so i can go back later and put in the exact name that i want or a cafe where she plays music i just made up in three X's or four X's and put them in and, and then later, you know, go back. Um, but also I looked at the maps and saw where she was going because that would push the plot forward, you know. And I also see those images, for example, she was, somebody picked her up with an RV there on the, they, they drive along the Columbus River towards uh, Portland and they rest, there's a rest stop. And I had to look it up because I wanted to see how the rest stop looked because that would kind of maybe induce an emotion. You know, the sun was setting and the river was there and they were having a picnic and stuff like that. So it's kind of a mixture, but um, I, it, for me, it makes sense to do some research, especially when it comes to locations. Uh, I spent like 10 minutes, 15 minutes on that, and then I write from there. And then I, I don't have to go back until, unless, and it's so quick, you know, you have your, you have your word processor open and you have your Google Maps open and you can just click, click over and do a street view and see what's on that street, you know, and then you can move on. So it's not really like hours in the library. It, I would say I did maybe like 15 minutes a day, look on the map and, and see where she's going next, but it wasn't too much trouble. You know, it wasn't like hours and hours. How did you, uh, or why did you pick Idaho? Because for me, that's completely the middle of nowhere. You know, it's it's sure. really, I mean, there is nothing, if you, you, I was just looking at the map and seeing where could she start out that is not near anything, you know, close to anything. Um, not a big city, um, which, so th that just came into my, I don't know. I just looked on the just, map. Just, and it, just wilderness. Yeah, as, it was. It looked a little could. desolate. You know, it looked a little yeah. desolate, and that's why I chose that because of the her emotional state was very desolate when she started out. What did you, uh, or, or when you got to the end of, of Six String and you you wound up with this very different book that doesn't have. Uh, dystopian technology, right. or doesn't doesn't have magic, or doesn't have time travel. Uh, did writing this book change your uh, view of who you are as a writer? Um, it, I think it expanded it a little bit. 
um, because I was hoping I wasn't kind of stuck in the genre of sci-fi yeah. and fantasy, and I I realized that I can. You know, nobody has read it yet, so maybe I'm totally wrong. <laughs> but that I can write something that is based on reality, and um, I want to maybe write more of that. It also got me out of the slump, the the deep hole I was in with the third White Dragon book, which I was kind of burned out a little bit. Yeah. And when I finished the sixth string, I felt the the juices returning to finish that like very strongly. So that that also brought me back to the to the fantasy genre. Um, yeah, but, I, but isn't that interesting how that happens? That you, uh, when you, I think some people might be scared that if they that if they go do something different, that this new shiny thing will uh, will get all of their attention and they'll never come back to the thing. Uh, but what I've experienced is when you shift gears and do something completely different. That frees your totally. your mind, your psyche, right. whatever, to to unloose those problems that right. you're having with that other thing, and it becomes more right. uh, urgent and you know and whatever. Right. That uh, I, I found that same thing to be true. Yeah, I think because the emotion, um, I think the emotion is what dries up when you have writer's block. It's not yeah. the words, you know, um, and when the emotion returns, I think the flow continues and if you write in a totally different genre you might ignite them again and then you can transfer them back to wherever you work before and you can continue in that same depth um you know of where you where you were yeah uh you have been quietly publishing uh, a series of non-fiction books mm-hmm. uh, all along as well um <laughs> what's that about and what 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 uh, where does that come from for you <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, it's like the Fight Club. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the first rule of nonfiction is you don't talk about nonfiction. <laughs> well, this is more like a, a passion of mine that I've done. Um, I've been on like a spiritual journey for close to 30 years. And it's something I could write books and books and books about. And, but I just yeah. don't um, I don't let it out so much um, because it's it's not something that I think a lot of people are going to read and um, I'm kind of keeping it quiet and Amy just says you have to do some ads and stuff and I really don't want to do a lot with it but it's kind of like a just a personal Thing that is now has developed a little bit into a series. I have like three or four other little books planned in that little series of the, the laws of peace. Um, it's going to be others like the laws of forgiveness and then the laws of healing and things like that. So it's kind of something on the side. Well, you know, after the year that we've had, uh, I think we need that more than more than ever. I, I think it's a an inspired thing that you're doing. I I, um, I, I think it's wonderful. Mm. <laughs> we we I, need we need to learn the laws of peace and forgiveness yeah, for sure it's, after it's this tricky. year. It's very tricky because you don't you know it's not it's not a Hallmark uh, cards book. It's the opposite of a Hallmark cards book. You know what I mean? It's not. It's really not about right. peace. It's about the fact that we don't want it. We we have want nothing to do with it whatsoever. And otherwise, we would have it. Right. So that's the first law. Right. You know, yeah. so as this year has borne out, um, right? <laughs> we, we don't, don't want to get along, or, or else we would have already, right. Right. <laughs> right? right. So it's it's not an easy subject, and it's it basically points the finger back to ourselves. And I I don't think um, we're ready on a on a big scale to to do that. You know what I mean? To to go back to ourselves yeah. and say, okay, so what what is what is my part in how I feel? You know. Mm. It's not. It's not easy. Yeah. No, so. it's not. No, it's not. Um, well, I, I hope everyone will go pick up a, a copy of the Laws of Peace. Uh, it's a fantastic <laughs> little book. What? And yeah. <laughs> 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 but but back to Nano. Um, what do you think? Uh, because you and I are very similar right. in that. 
Uh, I will write feverishly for three or four right. days, and then I'll not write for a few days. But uh, but I always say this, and, and and it's not an excuse. It really is true um, that I'll I'll walk around for three or four days, and I'm constantly thinking about the story, and and maybe I'm moving the story forward mm-hmm. in my right. mind so that when I sit down, the, those words flow right. again. Um, what I need to do is take that urgency of NaNoWriMo right. and apply that to every day yeah. uh, and, you know, and, and do like uh, Weston Oaks or do like Kevin Summers and uh, maybe remove that excuse that I've given myself and say, okay, let's start acting like a professional and, <laughs> and let's do this every day and, and move the story forward. Right. Um, that's what I need to do for me. And I haven't quite figured out how to maintain that urgency um, right. other than just forming a habit and just making a habit. Um, do you, uh, do you, have you picked up anything from the nano experience for doing it, you know, three or four years now uh, that, that you can apply to your everyday writing? Um, yes, I have. And that is that I, I would be, I'm very weak. When it comes to discipline in that in that area, the NaNoWriMo helps with keeping. You know, I really, I I didn't want to fail. The, yeah. the also my my friends that were with me. You know, they were like like you and everybody that was in our little group. Um, so that was the only thing that kept me going because I'm not. Uh, I'm like you. I'm like three four days. I don't do anything, and then I write again. Then I let it sit again. Then I write again, and I wish I would have more discipline, where I could write every day. You know, like, uh, like just pound out a thousand words a day, or five hundred even. But I, I'm not. I stopped after NaNoWriMo. I mean, I, you know, then I continued on with finishing the book. But, but I give myself much more time, which I think is also a good thing. Why not do fifty thousand words twice a year, and do the rest? Let it let it sit, you know, and let it let it go back in, make it deeper, you know. So you do a chunk in a month, and then you do the rest of the six months, fine tuning, finishing, editing, you know that stuff. Um, I think both have their legitimacy, I, because they're, they're, our lives aren't structured in a way that we have every day exactly the same happening, you know. With, especially with kids and, and, and work and stuff, you have to be totally flexible and you can't, I think that's also set up for failure. If you would say, I have to write a thousand words a day, you don't, you know, we're our own yeah. people. So we're all different in that way. I, I think one of the things that, that scares me uh, is, uh, is forming a habit and, and learning that uh, that my writing space and stuff has to be precious, right. Um, right. you know. Because one thing that I I do enjoy is that I can grab my laptop and I can be sitting in the living room with all of my family right. and something's going on and I can you know write out a page right. or I can grab my iPad and uh, you know maybe I'm in the car and I can jot down. Um, but I know some people. You know, have to be in their comfortable chair, and the lighting has to be just right, and they have to have a cup of coffee, right. and or, or the words don't come, and, and I don't ever want to get to that place. Um, but I, I need to find a happy medium between those two <laughs> right. things. Yeah. Right. I know. Yeah. Oh yeah, but I but I like what you said. I, I think there uh, life comes in seasons, you know, and 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 maybe there's the, a season to. Uh, uh, you know that, that there's serious novel writing in this season, and then there's editing over right. here, and there's planning for future things over here, and um, you know maybe that's not a bad yeah, I thing. I don't think so. I think it's a good thing, and also because we're not emotionally, we're not equal, even the same every day. Otherwise, we wouldn't be writers. You True. know, so you have to True. kind of write out the deep emotions, and then maybe catch them at the at the back end and write from there. Or you catch them while they're happening, and you you know it's it's very very fluid. I think it's kind of like you listen. You just have to listen. If if there's a day when nothing comes in, all right, that's fine. You know, you just take the next thing, and uh, yeah, all good. 
Awesome. Uh, so when can we expect to see Six String um, published? I'm, I think I'm giving it to Ellen in, on January, uh, on February 6th. I have it, I'm going to push it out to my trusted friends um, in next week, and then uh, beginning of February is the editing, and then I think by the third week, or the towards the end of February, I think it's going to come out. All shiny. Awesome. All shiny. Uh, do you have your cover art uh, yep. in place yet? Yep. Yep. I'm just I'm just nice. buying the. Uh, I think it's fifty dollars for the for the image, but we have it pretty much pretty much done. For the, at least for the ebook. Cool. And then I just have to finish nice. two more three more songs, I think. Um, and then, you know, we, we were even thinking about Amy's doing um, a vinyl a vinyl cover. For the what's the end of the book because you know it's going to be an album at the end of the, her journey. So, um, so she writes all those songs. Oh, how cool! And, you know, it's it's very that's such a cool. It's just so creative the whole oh, writing yeah. thing. You know, you can do your own. So, are are you recording a companion <laughs> album to go with? It? <laughs> that would be the end of it, Ted. That would be the absolute end of it. That would be like. You know, Ian singing second voice. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Ian, you didn't. Don't listen to that. Don't listen. Don't. <laughs> no, I mean it would be. It would be. I mean, my dream obviously would be to find like a singer with an amazing voice and have her record all those songs and then you know whatever. But that's just in my head. So. Oh yeah, that would be so awesome. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see how it turns out. Um, Stefan, buddy, it's uh, it's always a, a joy yeah, and a pleasure to, to talk with you and to have you on the show. Thank you for for uh, getting up early on the Saturday morning. To sure, do this. it's five o'clock, so it's it's, <laughs> uh, it's five o'clock somewhere. Right, uh, right. Well, uh, uh, Merry Christmas to yep. you, and uh, I hope y'all uh, have a fantastic holiday. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Author Stories Podcast with Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. When you're there, please subscribe to the show and leave a comment over on iTunes or Google Play. You can even subscribe at YouTube and Stitcher Radio. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy what I do, uh, podcasting or my writing, please uh, check out my Patreon campaign. There's a link at hankgarner.com. Be sure to tune in every Tuesday and Friday for brand new episodes of the Author Stories Podcast. Thanks for listening.